We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. And for those of you who have ever heard me mention Hebrews chapter 11, I always refer to it as the Hall of Faith. You know, you've got a Hall of Fame for people that have done outstanding things. It might be baseball, might be basketball, might be all kinds of different things. But this is our Hall of Fame for faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we got a lot of, a lot of people to look at, but the first uh, verse is that faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. And it gives us assurance about the things that we cannot see. It tells us that there are things out there that we can't see, but we know they're going to happen. Why? Because we operate in faith. That's what it's all about. Uh, if you've got a King James or a new King James, it says it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And as we go through the Hall of Faith, we're not going to read the whole Hall of Faith, but it talks about Abel and Enoch and, and Noah and Abram and, and uh, Isaac and Sarah and Jacob and all these guys. But we're going to kind of home in on later on in the chapter, and we're going to begin in verse 24. When it begins to talk about Moses, and it says it was by faith that Moses' parents hid him. Oh, I'm in the wrong verse. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Uh, in a New King James or a King James Version, it says, for, rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Realize that sin is fun. Okay, if it wasn't, there wouldn't be anybody doing it. Hello. If sin was like mashing your thumb with a hammer, uh, it would be a short line. But it's fun for a season. You've heard me say this many, many times. It is very enticing. And for the beginning part of it, it's always going to be fun. But the longer you stay in it, as I, you've probably heard me say this as well, it will take you further than you wanted to go. It will cost you more than you wanted to spend. And it will keep you away longer than you wanted to stay. Uh, sometimes we get the idea that, hey, this is going to be fun and it won't hurt anything, but it's, it's kind of like an octopus. It gets a tentacle on you and then another one and then another one. And the next thing you know, you're tangled up in this mess and there's no easy way out. So rather than enjoying that sin for a season, he decided that he was going to endure the, the, the persecution that he would receive by going ahead and admitting who he was and that he was a Hebrew. And it says in verse 26, he thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. Verse 27, it was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. And he kept right on going because he had kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the, the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. And it was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. And it was by faith, this is verse 30, it was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. Amen? If we walk by faith, we're going to get to see something happen. Amen? Let's pray. We'll get into the message. Father, again, thank you for this morning. Thank you for meeting us here. And Lord, thank you for um, just doing what you do. You're a great God. And we appreciate everything that you do for us. You always look out for us. You're always on our, on our side. And we just give you praise and honor and glory this morning. And as we're looking at how we walk by faith, this faith walk that we are on, God, I, I pray that you would meet every person that's here. And every person that hears this message, God, that you would meet us right where we're at and that you would encourage us to keep on keeping on. And Lord, we, we need that from you. We, we desire that from you. And Lord, this morning, we just thank you in advance for the great things you're going to do. And we give you praise for it all in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen. So the thing that, that you've got to realize is our faith will always be challenged. It's really, really super easy to say, I believe when you're in church on Sunday morning. Because usually you get amens when you say that. 
Let's, we'll try it one more time. It's really easy to believe in, on Sunday morning in church. But what about Monday when you go to work? Or to school? Or Wednesday, whenever something happens, something blows up that you were hoping wouldn't blow up, or anything that happens out there that challenges our faith or maybe discourages us in some way, it's not always as easy to believe then. If, as long as we're living in a little bubble of a world, as long as we're living in controlled circumstances, it's very, very easy to say, yes, I have faith. Sometimes it's a little bit tougher when it's not going your way. Amen? And so the thing that we've got to realize is that um, what we've got to do is realize what faith really is. And faith is realizing that there's something better out there. There's something that we're believing in that we cannot see, and there's something way, way, way better than what we're going through at this particular time. Martin Luther, uh, who was the, uh, the founder of the Protestant movement, he was actually a Catholic priest, and in reading and studying his Bible, he came across the fact that we are saved by faith, that we're justified by faith and not by our works. It wasn't a popular message in his church. And so he uh, wrote a little thesis on it. Supposedly, history has it that he nailed it to the door. And it was called the 95 Thesis. And it got him the left foot of disfellowship out of the church. So they did that to him. And he was declared to be a protestant of the Catholic Church, which is where we get our modern-day word, Protestant, that we are a Protestant church. And so his, his whole summation was that we're saved by faith and, and not by our works. But he said this, he said, Just as no one can go to hell or heaven for me, no one can believe for me. So no one can open the door or close the door to heaven or hell for me, and no one can drive me to believe or disbelieve. It's a personal thing. It is a choice. It is a volitional act of our will, whether we're going to choose to believe or not believe. Thomas, uh, one of the disciples, whenever Jesus was crucified and, and buried, his response to those who had gone and seen him in the tomb was... Until I see his hands and his side and I put my finger through those nail prints and thrust my hand into his side, what was his response? I will not believe. An act of will. Now, of course, we know that Jesus did appear and the first thing he said was, come here, Tommy. Come here, come here, let me show you a little something. <laughs> and he said, put your finger in those nail prints. Thrust your hand in my side. When Thomas saw him, what did he do? He fell down on his knees and said, oh Lord, my God. And he said to Thomas, he said, you're blessed because you see and believe. He must have been from Missouri. That's the show me state, in case you didn't know that. Thomas was from Missouri. He was from the show me state. But whenever he saw, he believed. And Jesus said, you're blessed because you have seen and believed. But more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And you know, unless I'm mistaken, that includes all of us. Because we haven't physically seen Jesus, but yet we believe. What an awesome thing it is to be counted in. Even back then that Jesus knew there would be us who would come along and not be able to have the opportunity to see it physically. But yet, when we believe, he says we are blessed because of it. Somebody say amen. amen. So... Here's the thing, if we make it an act of our will to believe, if we take God at his word, regardless of how unrealistic it might seem at that particular moment, have you ever been in a spot where you said, hey, I know what God says, but right now these eyes can't see it. That's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things we cannot see. It is a, an essential part, it is a necessary characteristic for us as born-again believers that we have faith. Number one, we're saved by faith. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we, it is by grace that we are saved through faith. And that's not anything that we do in and of ourselves. And it's not, it, it is a free gift from God. And it's not anything that we can do. It's not of our works because some of us would go around and boast about it. Amen? We'd pop our suspenders and say, look what I did to be saved. It's a free gift from God. We can't earn it. It is, it is that we are saved by faith. It also tells us in Galatians chapter 2 that we are to live by faith. 
The Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Notice he did not say, I live by faith in the Son of God. He knew where his faith comes from. It's, a, it's, it's basically an allowance. It tells us in the Bible that it's given to each one of us an amount of faith to be able to believe. That comes from God. Now, what we do with that faith, if we exercise it, faith is a whole lot like a muscle. Okay? If I get some dumbbells and I'm just, every time I get a chance, I'm just sitting there and I'm, boy, I'm, I'm working out. I'm just over and over and over again pumping that iron. What, what's going to happen? Wait a minute. Let me get that going here. All of a sudden, I'm going to be ripped. You know, there's just, I, I know my limitations. I just don't want to get too big. It's hard to find shirts to fit. So, I mean, you know, bodies like this aren't just born. They are made. <laughs> so the thing that we've got to do is take that little bit of allowance of faith that God gives us and exercise it. And if we'll exercise it, if we'll begin to believe for the little things, then all of a sudden we're able to believe for bigger things. Why? Because our faith has been exercised and it grows. And all of a sudden we're believing for things that we once would have thought impossible. Because our faith has grown to that level. That we need to, we need to realize that there's no lack with us. God gives it to us. It's, it's already given. The thing that we gotta do is exercise that faith. So we are to live by faith. We know that Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, which we did not read this morning, tells us that it's impossible to please God without faith. That if we come to God, that we must acknowledge who He is and that He's the rewarder of those who would diligently seek after Him. So we, we've got to realize that we, we, we are saved by faith. We are to live by faith, and then we are to walk by faith. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. If you're walking by sight, you'll never get anywhere with God. It's always got to be a faith walk, because God will always call you to do bigger things than you think you are capable of doing. God will always call you to do God-sized projects and not man-sized projects. And so what we've got to do is walk by faith and not by sight. So the thing that we're looking at in this text here is that sometimes what it takes is a walk of faith or in this instance we're going to call it faith walks. Because all of these people that we named off, Abram and Isaac and Sarah and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, all had a walk of faith. So we're going to look at Moses faith walk, and see what he accomplished while he was there and how it applies to us. And in, in verse 27, it tells us that it was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. So faith walks out of bondage. Okay? There's a big thing here that you, if you're not paying attention, you'll miss it. And that says that he walked, uh, he walked out of that bondage and he, and he, and he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, the Pharaoh's anger. There was a time when he did fear Pharaoh's anger. It was about 40 years prior to this. Because you gotta realize here's Moses and he's at this point in time about 80 years old. Now, when he was about 40 years old, he realized who he was, that he was a Hebrew, and made that choice, I'm not going to live as Pharaoh's daughter's son. And when he did that, it opened up his eyes to all the things that were happening. And what happened was, he went down among the Hebrews one day, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And he killed him. His anger just got the best of him, and he jumped in there, I'm going to fix this, and he killed the Egyptian. And to cover it up, he hit him in the sand. And then the next day, he's down there, and there's two Hebrews arguing among themselves, and he comes up there and says, listen, y'all are brothers, don't be fighting, all this kind of stuff. And they said, what are you going to do? You're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? Uh-oh, somebody saw that. And what happened? Because he feared, you can read it in Exodus chapter 2, because he feared the wrath of Pharaoh, left town. 
For the next 40 years, he lives on the backside of the wilderness, tending sheep. Until one day he sees a burning bush from way across the way, and it won't go out. It's this bush that keeps burning, but it's not consuming the bush. And he says, I've got to go look at this. I've got to see this. And the thing was that whenever God spoke to him through that burning bush, and you know that story, we're not going to get into all that today, but he told him, he said, you're the chosen person, I've chosen you to go and get my people out of bondage. And Moses, as you know, had all the reasons why, who am I going to tell him sent me, I can't speak good, all this kind of stuff. And finally, he gets a hold of what God has told him to do. And at this point in time, he goes back to Egypt, not as a cowering person fearing Pharaoh, but as a person with his shoulders squared, let my people go. Wait a minute, I've got to get there let my people go. <laughs> okay? You just got to figure Moses is that kind of voice. I don't, I don't know if it's true or not. You just got to figure he had that booming voice. Um, here's the thing, though. Fear drove him out of Egypt the first time. Faith brought him back to lead other people out. In this life, you will either be driven by fear or you will be led by faith. One or the other. There are too many people that spend their whole life in fear of something. I've known people who were so fearful to move out on anything because all, they could start reeling off all these things that would go wrong. Well, what if this happens? Or what if that happens? Or what if this doesn't happen? Or, or, or does or doesn't or whatever. And they lived their whole life in this small little world that I was talking about a while ago that it's easy to believe. If you're going to do what God's called you to do, you've got to break out of that little bubble. And you're going, to, you're going to come up against people who do not believe like you believe, do not uh, go with the flow like you go with the flow. You've got people who are going to ridicule you because of your faith. They're going to call you backwards. They're going to call you silly because you dare to believe in an ancient book. But here's the thing. To the person who an explanation is necessary, no explanation will do. And to a person who believes, no explanation is necessary. Amen? The thing that we know is just like I've said before. You know, somebody will say, how, why do you believe? How, why would you believe all that? Why would you believe that Jesus is alive? He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. You've come too late for an argument about God not being real. Amen. You've come way too late for that. You've come too late to convince me that God still doesn't heal. You've come too late to convince me that God doesn't deliver people. You've come too late to tell me that God doesn't save and forgive those sins that we once had and now they're gone. You've come too late to convince me that everything that He's promised that we're going to receive one day is not real. And that's where our hope lies in His blessed second coming. Amen. When He's coming back to get us. Somebody say amen. So the thing that we've got to do is we've got to realize that we're, faith is that integral part of us. We're saved by faith. We walk by faith. We, we live by faith. All those kinds of things. And if we will allow him to, our faith walks out of bondage. The bondage of fear. And most for most of us, it is the fear of man. What are people going to think? What are people going to say? How are people going to react whenever I tell them that God's called me to do this? Our fear so many times is absolutely about other people. And what we ought to be thinking about is what God has called us to do. Don't fear the one, he says, don't fear the one who can kill the body, but fear the one who can condemn soul and body to hell. So the, if there's any fear, it ought to be the reverence that we have toward God and not the fear of other people and what they're going to say or what they're going to think. Like Moses, we can fear somebody and be driven into the wilderness or like Moses, we can have faith and be led back to deliver God's people. Somebody say amen. So he was uh, allowed his faith to walk out of bondage. What kind of bondage are you in today? It might be a, an emotional bondage. 
It might be that fear of other people. It might be a financial bondage. I'm so hemmed in financially. I can't. I don't have room to breathe. I don't have room to. I, I feel like I don't have a margin to tithe or to give toward the kingdom. You're robbing yourself of blessings when you do that. Allow yourself enough margin in your budget to be able to give toward God, to be generous toward God, because He's already been generous towards you. And the thing that we've got to see is whatever bondage it is, if we identify that, that we need to let our faith walk us right out of that bondage. Amen? Amen. Second thing, faith walks in obedience. In verse 28, this is what it says. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover, to sprinkle the blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. So Moses, this is where the Passover started. This wasn't like there was something already there. It was something God told him to do. And he went out and told the children of Israel, we're going to keep this. It's going to be called the Passover. And the whole reason that's called is because the death angel passed over. Now, realizing that that is an institution that he said at that time, God said, this will be an everlasting covenant with me and my people. And we celebrate it in communion. It's that same blood with the the grape juice and the same bread, unleavened bread, with our communion bread. And it is so good. Amen. Just can't, can't pass that by without saying that. But it didn't make sense. How could us, sitting down and eating some unleavened bread and killing a poor little innocent lamb and the peta group was just going nuts about animal rights and they said, how dare you take the blood of that poor innocent little lamb and splash it on your doorpost? That's just gross. Can you imagine how that's going to stink in the morning? Hello? You just think about how it would fly today. We're going to go kill this poor, innocent, cute, little bouncy lamb that never did anything wrong to anybody. It didn't deserve that. And you're going to splash that. That's just gross. But I'm telling you, if we will act in obedience, regardless of how crazy it may seem, regardless of what other people are going to think, most of the time, as as I've said to you many, many times, when, when God asks you to do something, when God speaks to you, number one, it's going to take faith to move out on it. Number two, it's not going to make sense to the world. Never will what God does make sense. God's formulas do not compute in, the, in this world, in the secular world. They're going to say, you're crazy. How could, how could splashing that blood on the doorpost, the pillar and post of your door, keep that, uh, you know, uh, uh, an angel? You're going to believe there's going to be a death angel? But here's the thing. It's the evidence of things not seen. I'm just telling you, when God speaks to you, it will take faith to move out on it. It will not make sense in the eyes of the world. And so what we've got to do is realize that when God gives us that word, and he gave that word to Moses, and that word was what changed everything from that moment on it was all different and uh, uh we've got to realize that when god calls us to do anything regardless if it don't make sense do it anyway let your faith walk in obedience to whatever it is he says fact is sometimes we get to thinking it out and we think something would be so much better if you remember and it's in first samuel chapter 15 king saul goes in he's taking he, conquest, taking these people that, that God says they that we're going to take their land and it's going to be yours and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know why God hated them so bad, but God said, go in and utterly destroy them. Don't even bring back any cattle. And so Saul goes in and he leaves the women alive and, he, and the young kids and he's bringing back cattle and sheep and all this kind of stuff. And Samuel meets him halfway in the way and he says, why didn't you do what God said? And Samuel says, or Saul says, I, it, I did better than that. I'm bringing back all these cattle so that we can sacrifice them to the Lord. And that was the day. And Samuel gave the word. He said, because you can't obey, the kingdom's going to be stripped from you. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. 
We can tell God, oh, if you'll do, I'm going to go do great things for you, God. And God says, I'd rather you just be obedient. Because sometimes it may be a small, small thing. I think all of us want to do some huge, big, tremendous thing that our name will be remembered forever for what I did for the kingdom. And God says, I just need your obedience in this one little thing. As I, I brought it to your attention before, but how many of you ever heard? It's, it's a guy who was an evangelist, and some people have heard of him. You may not have. Billy Graham? Okay, very quickly, and there might be somebody that can, can name it, but who was the pastor that led him to the Lord? I did know it at one time, and I can't remember it right this second. But he never was famous. But guess what he did for the kingdom? What if the only one person that you're ever called to witness to is the next Billy Graham? Your name may not be remembered forever, but you're going to be responsible. You're going to have a a buy-in on thousands and thousands and thousands of souls that come into the kingdom. Amen? And God says, I just want your obedience, even if it's the smallest of things. You don't have to do great things. Just do the thing that God's calling you to do. Amen? So faith walks in obedience. Number four, number three. I'm trying to get ahead of myself. Faith walks through trouble. As they were, this is verse 29. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though it were on dry ground. But the Egyptians, when they tried to follow, they were all drowned. Now here's the thing. Our faith, if we're truly following God, is probably going to take us through some troubling times. The fact is, let me just go ahead and say this. I'll guarantee you. Amen? And you say, Pastor, that's kind of a doggy downer there. But this is what the Bible says. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 34, it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Okay? We're made righteous through Jesus, so we're the righteous. Uh, in John chapter 16, it says, In this world you will have tribulation. That's Jesus talking. If you look it up in your Bible, that's going to be red letters. But, and what have I said about but? It's that conjunction that does away with everything in front of it. Okay? I was going to go to the grocery, but... I decided to sit in my easy chair. So what is the essence of that statement? I sat in my easy chair, and now I'm hungry. (laughs) Because I didn't go to the grocery. It does away with everything in front of it. So if I, and I've always laughed about this, in church world, you better duck. If somebody says, I love you, but, you better duck, because there's something coming your way. So if many are the afflictions of the righteous in Psalm 34, if that was a period there, but it's not, that would be pretty bad. It says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. Amen? Oh, that but makes a big difference. You've heard me say it many times, how big is your but? Because what we get to doing is, oh, all this stuff was going wrong, and this was going wrong, and that was going wrong. There ought to be a but in there somewhere. But you know what? The Lord saw me through every bit of that. Amen? All this was going on and, and uh, that, was, that was going wrong and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? Here I am today as a testimony to what the Lord can do. Amen? Jesus said it in John chapter 16. In this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. In other words... Be happy about it. Have some joy about it because he overcame the world and we're going to overcome the world. Be of good cheer because I have overcome the world and you are too. Amen? In case you didn't know this, in case you didn't read the last chapter of the book, guess what? We're getting out of here. Amen? (laughs) Woo-woo! I don't know if that makes you happy. It does me because you look around and this thing's a mess. I'm looking forward to that day whenever he's coming back. Amen? So... What we need to do is realize that we're going to have that trouble in our lives, regardless of what it is, but we don't have to give in to it. 
As I, I think I shared this a few Sundays ago. I remember asking a guy one time, how are you doing? He said, pretty good under the circumstances. And I said, what are you doing under there? We don't, we have the victory. Amen. We may have days when it don't look like it. There may be days whenever we're looking around and saying, I don't know how this is going to end up. I know Jesus said it's going to end up good. And right this second, I don't know how. But the thing is, it's going to happen. That's what faith does. Faith says, I'm getting out of this mess. Faith says, I've got the victory over these troubles that have come my way. And I don't know how, but it's going to happen. Amen. That's worth a hand clap for the Lord. So the thing that we've got to realize is to the one who believes, we've got the victory. Amen? Ultimately, we win. Exclamation point. That's it. We win. So faith is going to walk out of trouble. And finally, verse 30, faith walks around the enemy. In verse 30, now this is after Moses has already died. Moses led them to the edge of the promised land, and you know the story, because he had smote the rock in the wilderness instead of talking to it. Uh, that was his obedience test there. He got to go to heaven, but he didn't get to go to the promised land. And so Joshua takes over, and as I've said many, many times, how would you like to be Joshua? You're fixing to go into the promised land, and you've got to fill Moses' shoes. As a leader. He'd been their leader for 40 years. That was the only leader that some generations involved had ever known. How would you like to follow him up? That would be a tough tough place to be. But Joshua brings them into the promised land. And the first thing that happens is, all of a sudden, here's a test. Here's a trial. we got these people that are inhabiting this land. And God tells them, if you'll go in there, this first city that you come to is Jericho. And what I want you to do is I want you to grab every spear and every sword you've got. And if you can make a cannon, it's this thing that's kind of round and you put a cannonball in it. You make one of those and then maybe a bazooka or two. And you're going to go in and you're just going to blow this place out of the water. Oh, wait, that was the wrong book. What does he tell them? Here's this pe people that you're... People that you're facing that are big and mean and a whole lot more of them than you. And guess what? I want you to go in there. What? You mean we're not hooping and hollering, talking ugly to them over the wall? No, he said, just walk around them. And, and on the second day, I want you to walk around it, around it twice. And, and on the third day, go ahead and walk around it three times. And then on the last day, I want you to walk around it seven times. And on the last one, that's when you get the hoop and holler. And guess what happened? Can't you imagine those people that were living inside that big, huge, walled city? We're safe in here. Those people don't have any cannons or bazookas. And all of a sudden, phew, the walls are gone. I bet those that were left inside, chogied right on out of there. <laughs> Picking them up and putting them down. You, got, you just got to imagine how that was. That it just, phew, this huge, big wall. The children of Israel, they come up to the water. Red Sea. Oh, Pharaoh's got us now. You know what happened? Moses, why'd you bring us out here in the middle of the wilderness to die? God could have killed us there, but no, you bring us out here. And Moses is like, oh God, what am I going to do now? I just take that staff and hit that water. Whew. Water's parted. See, I'm going to tell you something. When God gives you a formula... It's not going to make sense. How are we going to how are we going to conquer this big city? Walk around it seven times. Excuse me. How how are we going to how are we going to cross this Red Sea? Pharaoh is bearing down on us. Just whoop it with that stick. And you know that's what it seemed like to them. Whoop it with a stick. <laughs> What are you talking about? 
But how many times have you ever got something from God when it made sense? If we can figure it out, guess what? It's probably about us. And so here they are, walking around this big city and walking through that Red Sea. I mean, you know, it just says that, that it was like it was walled up. The water was just walled up, and they're walking through like on dry ground. Can you imagine? It would be like walking over there at the aquarium in Galveston. And you're just seeing fish and stingrays. and I don't know if they could reach in it or not. It'd be tempting, wouldn't it? But here you are. You're walking through all the trouble. Trouble on every side. And if it had not worked, guess what? It would have covered them up. But because they had faith, they walked right through the trouble. Everything that could cause them grief, they walked right through it. This big city that they couldn't penetrate, that they couldn't get into, but they were supposed to take it for the kingdom, walked right around that city. All kinds of trouble. Had they thrown a rock, taken a slingshot, and tried to shoot somebody off the wall, they'd have rained down on them. But guess what? We just quietly walked around it. And all of a sudden, God rescues us. See, I believe God's already spoken to some people in this room today. And whatever he told you might not have made sense. How am I going to get out of this financial trouble? And God may have given you an idea that you just said, this is crazy. But guess what? Sometimes crazy is exactly the way God heads it. It's crazy to whoop that water with a stick and it just parts. Yeah. But it happened. So here's the thing. Faith Walks out of bondage, whatever it is that you're in. Faith walks in obedience to whatever God says. Faith walks us through the trouble, and he walks us around our enemy. Walked around Jericho, walked through that water, and guess what? Whenever they got across, and the last person ended up, and here's Pharaoh in hot pursuit. Guess what? Pharaoh gets right in the middle of it. And if we'll listen to God, It's not going to make sense. Walk around it seven times. If you're sick, call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint you with oil. Well, how's that going to cure anything? We don't have to know. We just got to believe what God said. Whenever, whenever, how can, how can I be blessed by giving my money to the church? Hello? Everything in kingdom world works a little bit opposite. Amen? Amen? In order to save our life, we've got to give it away. In order to be blessed, we've got to give our money away. In order to, to reap rewards and benefits, we've got, to, we've got to help other people. We've got to do things for other people. And so whatever the formula is that God has whispered in your ear, again, it might be an idea. I've seen God give people million-dollar ideas. And it wasn't just so that they could say, I'm a millionaire and all this kind of... It was so that they would be blessed because God knew he could trust them with it. So God may be whispering in your ear, there's something, some plan, some idea, something that seems so far-fetched. Don't just dismiss it. Give God the opportunity. Say, God, here I am, and I'm hearing what you're saying. Just like Lisa read that scripture a while ago. Here's little Samuel... Little thing, Samuel, he goes running in there to Eli, what you need? I didn't call you, go back to bed. He goes back to bed, Samuel, run in there one more time, what you need, Eli? Boy, what is the matter with you? Go to bed. Third time, he comes back, hears that voice calling his name. Eli, what is it? I'm hearing... And even Eli, as backslidden as he was, realized that it was the voice of the Lord. Now, this is the difference between me and Eli. If he'd have come in there the third time and I'd have discerned that it was the Lord's voice, I'd say, come on, boy, let's go back to that room together. I want some of this. But he told him, he said, you go back to your room, and if you hear that voice again, just say, yes, Lord, I'm your servant. And you know what? God laid it all out there for Samuel, showed him what was going to happen, And here's the thing, if we'll just listen, 
I am a firm, firm believer that if we'll get tuned in, okay, if we bring a radio up here, this little box that you put a battery in, and that thing, you can hear voices on it, and it's not even connected to anything. You think about how strange that would have seemed to somebody 200 years ago. See, we've got a receiver, and you don't even have to put a battery in it. The thing we've got to do is turn off the TV and the telephone and all that other junk and get it tuned in to hear the transmission that's already there. I believe every person in here, I believe every born-again believer can hear from the Lord. Amen? The thing we've got to do is get tuned in. And by faith, we can do it. Amen? We're going to walk out of that bondage, walk by obedience, walk through that trouble and around our enemy, and, and individually and together, we are going to accomplish some great things. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for caring so much about us that you uh, are willing to speak to us as individuals. And Lord, you're also speaking to us as a church, and, and I'm excited about the things that are going on. I think you're inspiring people to do ministry. As I said, we're going to look at that later in next month. But Lord, we want to do everything you're calling us to do. And I know that you are not done with us. I know that you're not through with the things you want to do here at Family Worship Center. There are ministries yet to be birthed. There are ideas that are just floating around out there that you need somebody to hear. And so, God, as we, by faith, are expecting great things, I believe that that atmosphere of faith is, and expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles. God, I, I pray that you would just meet us at our needs, that you would speak to us the things that we need to do. Lord, maybe there's somebody in bondage this morning here. Maybe there's something that's holding them back from receiving everything you got for them. Lord, show them a plan to get out from under that. Show them a plan of what you need them to do, what bondage they need to throw off to the side, and how they need to get out of that. But God, right now, I'm just asking you that you would speak to each of us. And Lord, let us know the great things that you've got planned for us as a church. And God, the things that you want us to accomplish as a church. And Lord, I, I'm just expecting great things, and I'm looking forward to it. I thank you, O oh God. For just how much you love us. I thank you for your mercy that endures forever. God, thank you for being merciful toward us. Thank you for, for taking time with us. I know sometimes we, I, I, I'll speak for me. I know sometimes I probably stress you out. I probably stretch your patience. But Lord, thank you for dealing with me. Thank you for loving me that much. And Lord, we just give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in advance for, for all the great things that you're going to do. And Lord, we just give you praise for it in Jesus' name. While every head's still bowed, every eye's closed, very quickly, I'd feel remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity. But if you're here today, and maybe you're just saying, Brother Philip, there's, there is a bondage that I'm dealing with that I need to get out from under. And I just want you to agree with me right now that God is going to give me the answer to that problem it might be financial it might be something personal it might be something else but lord right now i'm just saying i want free from whatever this is that's holding me back might be a bad habit might be something that you've just been praying about for a long time but i'm just saying i'm going to agree with you if that's you just slip your hand up right now i just want i got to get rid of that bondage there yes yes lots of hands if you're here this morning maybe you're saying brother philip i I don't know the Lord like you're talking about knowing Him. Or maybe I have and maybe there's just maybe I realize that there's something I need to make right today. I don't want to leave this place till I make things right with God. If that's you, I want to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Wouldn't call your name. Wouldn't call you up front for nothing. I'm going to pray with you where you are. You don't have to leave where you're at to get to where God is. But if you're saying, I just need to make things right with God, would you slip your hand up so I can pray with you? Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Very quickly. Yes. We're going to pray about that first, and then we're going to pray about that other, about the bondage, but let's, let's get that right first. Just pray this in whatever way you want to. You don't have to pray it verbatim. It's not an not a incantation, but God, here we are. And we readily admit that we miss it sometimes. We, we need your help. 
And God, you know what, I, what I'm praying about. You know what everybody's praying about as individuals. We confess that. Lord, we don't want to be found lacking. We don't want to be found wanting. God, everything that we've done that would separate you and I. God, everything you, that I've done that you would be displeased with, I confess it to you. I ask you that you would forgive me, that you would truly come into my heart and into my life. I need you. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me enough that you died on that cross for me. You died for my sins so that I could go free. And there's no way I could ever repay you. But Lord, the thing that I can do is I can live for you. And I ask you that while I'm here on this earth, that you would lead me, guide me, direct me, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I thank you for loving me, and I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, if you meant it from your heart, then guess what? You are born into the kingdom, amen? And that's a wonderful thing, so give the Lord a hand clap for that. Now, for everybody...